Well, welcome. I'm Dr. Kleiner, and I'm your philosophy professor for the day. Uh, you Connection students have now all read um, The Allegory of the Cave, a selection from Plato's Republic. Um, and I'm going to talk some about it today, help you unpack some of the things that are going on in it. And I hope that afterwards, you as a class, and just as importantly, you with your friends, um, talk more about it, think about different interpretations, and all of the rest of it. A brief bit of background. Um, the Republic is written by Plato. Um, the dialogue was written in around 380 BC. Um, Socrates is the primary character in the dialogue. Um, and there was, without doubt, a historical Socrates. There was a guy named Socrates. He was a stonecutter by trade, uh, but a philosopher by vocation, so to speak. Um, and he had many students. One of his most famous students was Plato. Um, so what we get, though, in the dialogue is a character Socrates that's in a dramatic dialogue. Whether or not the historical Socrates had this conversation or any of the other conversations that are represented in the various Platonic dialogues is unclear. Sometimes we have reason to think that he did have these conversations. In this case, I think we have almost no reason to believe that the historical Socrates had this conversation. Instead, Plato, who's obviously a great admirer of Socrates, is using Socrates here as a vehicle for putting forward some of his own ideas. Um, the second sort of um, um, introductory note here is the dialogue, this passage for viewers, the allegory of the cave is taken from the Republic. The Republic is a really long dialogue, four or five hundred pages long. Um, the question of the overarching dialogue is what is justice? And is it better to live a just life rather than an unjust life? And they're trying to sort it out by creating a utopia. They're imagining a perfectly just city. And then from thinking about this perfectly just city, they're hoping to, to clear up what justice is and why justice is good. This comes from book seven out of ten books of the Republic. So you're about three-fourths of the way through the dialogue by the time this appears. Um, but you don't really need to know much of anything about the rest of the Republic in order to get an awful lot out of the allegory of the cave. It's probably the most famous single passage in the history of Western philosophy. Some of you have perhaps read it before in high school class or something like this. So, um, all right. So with that, let's let's um, let's dig in. It's an allegory. Um, an allegory is a kind of a story. An allegorical story is a story where the characters or the events in the story are meant to symbolize or represent something else. Very often, right, something real, right? So something in the story is meant to stand in for something real. Sometimes, and I think in this case, allegorical stories have a one-to-one -one relationship, right? For a thing in the story, it stands for some real thing. So. Uh, an allegorical story most, most of you are probably familiar with is C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. An obvious allegory. Aslan is quite obviously Jesus, right, who dies on the stone table and all of it. Peter is not so imaginatively Peter, right? You know, and it's, uh, yeah, it's an obvious allegory. Now, not all stories are allegories. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, that some of you might know. Tolkien was very clear that he did not want the Lord of the Rings to be read allegorically. The, the ring is not the nuclear bomb or, or you know, isn't Satan or something like this. He, he, he didn't think it was allegorical. But this is an allegory, which means that whatever characters and events are in the story, um, Plato thinks that there is some corresponding reality that these events and characters in the story are meant to symbolize. Well, all right, so can one of you describe? Socrates starts off describing this image, strange image, as Glaucon, who is Socrates' interlocutor here. Socrates starts off describing this strange image. What is the image? Yeah, there's a, there's a line of men chained together in a cave. Okay. Um, chained so that they cannot move their head or any other part of their body. They have, they have to stare at the back wall of the cave. The cave is open behind them, and there's a fire, like, I don't know, maybe at the mouth of the cave. 
Um, and between the fire and them, there's like a walkway almost. Yes. And it's also described as like a type of curtain with a walkway behind it. And people pass by on that walkway carrying like statues or like images of animals and things like that. And so what the people in the cave see are the shadows of those animals. Excellent. All right. Now, first of all, forgive the lousy drawing. The lowest grade I got in college was in uh, charcoal drawing. But um, uh, it really was. Um, but you have these cave dwellers. They are bound up in chains such that they can't turn their heads around. And they are looking at shadows that are being cast on the wall. These shadows are being cast because there's this low wall up here with fire, and people are holding things up. But this that's supposed to be a tree. And people are holding up trees or monkeys or you know whatever kinds of statues. And they're also, we find out later, making the appropriate sounds, right? So they hold up monkeys. They're making monkey sounds. And, and it's echoing in the base of the cave. So these people down here are seeing these shadowy images and hearing the sounds come along with them. Um, and then, you know, there is up above the real exit to the cave and the sun and all of the rest of it. Okay, so Glaucon says, well, that's a really strange image that you've shown us. Uh, and these are really strange prisoners. And Socrates says something that I hope you found a little bit disturbing. Who, who are these people in the allegory? They're like us, bottom of the first page. They're like ourselves, I replied. That's us. You are, Socrates, Plato is suggesting here, uh, a, a prisoner in a cave, <clears throat> looking only at the shadows of things. All right, so what ends up happening here? Right, before we get to that, what are they doing down there? What are these cave dwellers spending their time doing? Yeah, he says on, yeah, he says on page two, if they were able to converse with one another, would you not suppose that they were naming what comes before them? This, I think, is really significant. When, when you name something, what you're doing is you are you are identifying it. You're saying what it is. I mean, I I have young children, right? So, uh, and my favorite age is that kind of, you know, round two with language um, uh, speech um, language uh, theorists call it the language explosion, right? Where all of a sudden the kid starts naming stuff all over the place. And it's great fun taking him to the grocery store. It's Naming, naming it. Apple, orange, watermelon, banana, right? Naming everything. Now, what are they doing? They're, they're rendering their world intelligible to them, right? This ta activity of naming, naming is, is, is the activity of reason. It is our reason coming to intelligently apprehend an intelligible world. Human beings, this is a pretty unique activity in the world. Language, this, this ability to name. So they're they're naming the things that come before them because they desire to understand, right? There's some natural impulse that they have to render intelligible their experience, the world in which they find themselves. Now, of course, the trouble is that's not a tree. It's a shadow of, of a statue which is itself a copy of a real tree, right? They're, they're many times removed from really identifying the things, giving the things the name that, that properly deserve the name, right? The, the truth for them, this is page two, would literally be nothing but the shadows of things on the wall. Um, now, of course, they're none the wiser because they've been down there their whole lives and have never been able to turn around and this is their whole world, as it were. They don't know anything different. Okay, so now what ends up happening in the story? One of them gets released. We don't really get told how. Uh, he gets released, and what does he do? He leaves the cave. He starts, though. So Doesn't he stand and like, feel pain because he's been stuck in the same position watching the wall? Yeah, and it's worth noting here. This is on page two. One of them is released and disabused of their arrow. Error at first when any of them is liberated and compelled to stand up. You get the sense that one of them gets released, but he keeps just sitting there. He has to be made to turn around. He's compelled to turn around. And when he does turn around, 
it's painful for him because he's been what's well, like the experience when you go to a matinee movie and then if you go out the side exit where you go just immediately outside so your eyes are adjusted to the dark and then you go outside and you're you know the 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 light is dazzling to you and it's disorienting and even a little bit painful that's the experience that he has so he turns around and it's you know the the light from the fire is so bright that it's um, he's pained, he is uncomfortable and pretty unhappy. And then he's told by the person who's taking him out, hey, these things here, these things are nearer to being than the things you were seeing before. These, these things are more real than the things you were seeing before. Now, his, what do you expect his response is to that? You're crazy, right? What? What kind of nonsense are you talking about? This is craziness. So then page three, suppose once more he's reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent. It's hardly a voluntary participant. Dragged out and held fast. Now in the sunlight. You can imagine how disturbing that is to his eyesight, having had his eyes for his whole life been adjusted to the dark of the cave. He's held down, you know, look at look at it, the light, look at it. Ah, Right, and it's really traumatizing for him, right? And he's pained and, and dazzled and irritated and really, really unhappy. <clears throat> Except, eventually his eyes adjust. Right, and he starts kind of first looking at, you know, things and then kind of slowly looks up, looks at the tree, and then finally, even though his mom told him not to, he looks directly at the sun. Um, and, and when he looks at the sun... He sees the truth of everything. This is page three. Um, last of all, he'll be able to see the sun and not mere reflections of him in the water, but he will see him, he's kind of per per personalizing the sun here, in his own proper place and not in another, and he will contemplate him as he is, and he'll see the sun as the thing who gives the seasons of the years and the years and is in a certain sense the cause of everything else that is. The sun, somehow, what he, he gets to here is like the, the first principle of everything else. And having apprehended the first principle of everything else, he's, he's become wise. It's knowledge. He, he understands everything. And he's overjoyed. Um, and he looks back at his former comrades in the base of the cave and he feels, he feels sorry for them. But he doesn't get to stay out there. He's made to go back down. And what is his experience when he returns? Yeah. He will always chain up again, and he goes back to like playing the game of like naming the things that are on the wall. He's terrible at it because his eyes aren't adjusted to the dark, and so all the rest of his comrades in the cave, and you like make fun of him, like, oh, we're never going to leave the cave. Like, if someone comes out, we're going to try to. If someone comes to get one of us, we're going to turn on them and kill them so that they don't take us out. Yeah, so you can imagine this guy's response. He comes down, he says, hey, guys, guess what? You've been living a lie your whole lives. Nothing that you believe is really true. But I've seen the light, literally, right? You know, the, the allegory here is pretty obvious. I've seen the light, I've seen the truth. And come with me, you've got to check this out. You're crazy, right? Well, all right, let's see how great you are. And they play like a cave dwellers jeopardy game it's like a knowledge bowl who can name the most things that come in front and you'll see around campus you'll see it must be in some you know forestry class or something you'll see students on campus walking around with a clipboard looking really closely and intently at trees and i presume what they're doing is who can i sort of identify the various species of tree around campus and the students that know the most will be able to name the greatest number of trees as they walk around with their little clipboards. I mean, that's what it is to have knowledge in a certain sense is to know the name of a thing. And that's why when, when somebody says something rotten about us or something, we say, well, that person, she doesn't even know my name. Right? She doesn't know me because she hasn't named me. She doesn't know my name. So these people down on the base of the cave, like, well, all right, let's smarty pants. Let's see how much wisdom you've actually acquired. And he does terribly, right? Because he has the reverse problem. You'll have this sometimes your roommate, like you're getting ready to go to bed, and your roommate flips off the light without warning you. And if you're staring up at the ceiling, and you get those like starbursts in your eyes and you're disoriented just in the opposite direction. So he does terribly at the game. 
And, and and it's not just that they laugh at him. They think, look, this guy's dangerous. He's coming down, upsetting everybody's kind of conventional opinion about things. And so, yeah, they say at the bottom of page four, if anybody else tries to pull what this guy's pulled, we'll catch him, we'll, we'll kill him. Plato is clearly referencing Socrates here because Socrates was tried, found guilty, and ultimately executed in Athens for practicing philosophy. For, for upsetting people by challenging their conventional opinions. And there's no doubt that Plato is thinking of Socrates there. Right? Cause this is written about 20 years after Socrates had died. <clears throat> well, okay. Um, <clears throat> let's think a bit more about the allegory. The sun is, is you know, the truth of everything in some sense. It's, it's a first principle of everything else. We know these people are supposed to be like us. He didn't ever tell us who these people were. Uh, who do you think those people might be? Any ideas? Yeah. Maybe those in power, those who like to keep others in the dark. So these people are most definitely in a position of extraordinary power, right? Because whatever they hold up, determines the opinions and beliefs and attitudes of everybody else. They are in a position of incredible power. In our society, who might these people be? Who are the opinion makers? That's what these people are, they're the opinion makers. <clears throat> yeah, the government, which shapes opinions by making laws that, right, that, that uh, encourage certain behaviors, discourage other kinds of behaviors, encourage certain attitudes, discourage others. So the state. Um, teachers and mentors. <clears throat> teachers. You could really get into a kind of Pink floyd -y kind of interpretation here of teachers. You know, leave those kids alone. Stop indoctrinating them into whatever ideology it is that the teachers are trying to indoctrinate them into. And, of course, parents. Uh Good parenting is just another way of, say, brainwashing your children, right? Because you want your children to believe this, and you don't want them to believe that. You do a whole bunch of things to try to encourage them to believe that it's good to share and, you know, you know be honest and don't tell lies and all of these other kinds of things. Religious leaders. Religious leaders, uh, priests and ministers of whatever stripes who are shaping the opinions and beliefs of their flock, as it were. One more big one, I think. Uh, I think the yeah. <clears throat> now, where do people get a lot of their opinions and ideas that they have about what love is, and, uh, what marriage is supposed to look like, but from, you know, television shows and, and, and movies and uh, all of the music that we listen to. It's a powerful force um, in shaping people's opinions. So good. All right. So... <clears throat> last bit of the allegory you have these sort of two worlds you've got the base of the cave and then this world outside of the cave what does Socrates say these two worlds stand for what is the base of the cave society uh, society, it certainly is the world of kind of conventional opinion and conventional, you know, practice. Ignorance. These people are definitely ignorant, because what is ignorance? Ignorance is, is misnaming things, right? Saying something is X when it's not X. But he gets more of a metaphysical interpretation himself. Metaphysics is that branch of philosophy that studies reality. And he says on page five... Um, <clears throat> that this world down here is the sensible world. It's, you know, the physical world. And this world up here, he says, is the intellectual world, the world of ideas. And there's, so there is a sort of really interesting metaphysical claim here that, that Plato seems to think that mental reality, the world of ideas and of intelligence, is more real than the material world where things change all the time and they come and go. You might think of it in this way. The idea of a triangle, 
a triangle is a three-sided enclosed figure whose interior angle is summed to 180 degrees. That's an idea. Now, you know, there are material triangles, but those material triangles, they come and go. They don't last very long. In that sense, they're like shadows. They appear, but then they disappear. Whereas the idea, it remains always and forever, so long as there's a, at least so long as there's a mind to think it. For us, though, if you want to get into the cool metaphysical interpretations, take a philosophy class. For us, here's a, a, a bit sort of a toned down interpretation of it. This is the world of conventional opinion. People here have just accepted what they've been shown. They haven't thought about it. They are very passive observers and passive inheritors of the opinions that they have. This process here, as we'll talk about in a minute, is a process of getting educated. Um, and, and if nothing else, the person who escapes the cave is critically appropriating and inquiring into the beliefs that he has. Which is a timely thing, right? You're all about to start college. And you've inherited a whole bunch of opinions from your parents and your pastors and your priests and your friends and the media and all the whole rest of it. The super exciting thing about the thing you get to do now is think about it. I've always been told that this is true. Do I think it is? Why do I think it's true? Are there good reasons for thinking it, right? And, and a kind of critical assessment of those kinds of things. Um, but really, the meaning that I think is worth us focusing on, though Socrates himself focuses on it, is thinking of the allegory as telling us something about education. Um, this is page six. Socrates says, he's talking about two different kinds of confusion. Sometimes people get confused when they're going from the dark to the light because it takes their eyes a while to adjust. And sometimes people get confused because they're going from the light to the dark and it takes their eyes a while to adjust. But he makes, I think, a good practical point for students. He says, don't ever be too ready to laugh at someone who's confused. Because people are confused for one of two reasons. They're either going from lack of clarity to clarity, in which case you should be happy for them, or they're going from a place of clarity to a lack of clarity, in which case you should feel bad for them. But in either case, don't laugh at confused people. Right? They're moving in one of the two directions. But he's been talking about this confusion that he says on the middle of page six. But then if I'm right, certain professors of education must be wrong when they say that they can put a knowledge into the soul which was not there before, like putting sight into blind eyes. Some, Paulo Freya calls this view the banking model of education. In the banking model of education, the professor has some capital knowledge. The students all have empty accounts. And they passively sit there while the professor distributes his capital into the student accounts. The students will every once in a while make a, a deposit of their own in the form of a test or a paper or a quiz, but only to make the ultimate withdrawal at the end of a degree. But Socrates says, no, 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 that model of education where the student passively sits there while he just receives knowledge from his professors is wrong. It, yeah, it says, no, instead what our allegory has shown is that, this is continuing on page six, the power and capacity of learning exists in the soul already. And that just as the eye was unable to turn from darkness to light without the whole body, so too the instrument of knowledge, the mind, can only by the movement of the whole soul be turned from the world of becoming to that of being. The problem with these people in the base of the cave isn't that they, there's something wrong with their minds. Their problem is literally they're just looking at the wrong stuff. They need to turn around. Convert is actually another translation of the verb that's used there. Turn around. Reorient themselves. Not just sit there and wait for somebody to bring light down into the cave. They have to turn around and escape the cave for themselves. Now, a condition of this, he says, is that they have to turn their, their 
whole soul. If you want to see what's behind you, he says you have to turn your whole body because we're not owls. We have to turn our whole body around in order to see what's behind us. So he said you have to turn the whole soul around to turn the mind around. What's a whole soul? What's, you have a mind. What else do you have? What are some other sort of basic features of the human condition? You got a mind, you got a body. And along with the body comes heart. So spirit, you know, the heart. Passions, desires, and appetites, and then you've got a mind. And he says, and you have to turn the whole soul around. Education, your capacity to get an education is as much, if not more, a function of your desire as it is of the power of your mind. Your mind's just fine. The difference between my best students and my worst students is rarely a difference in mental capacity. It's almost always a difference in desire. See, you've got all kinds of desires, right? You want to watch CSI Anchorage, Alaska, or whatever. There's so many versions of that. And if you're sitting at home, like, well, all right, I really want to watch CSI Anchorage, but I know I have this studying to do tomorrow, right? That, that does, it's the desire. It's whether or not your desire has been turned towards the object of understanding or not, turned towards the task of education or not, that will determine your success. It's very rarely a mental deficiency, right? A student not being like, capable of understanding calculus. You're all capable of understanding calculus. It's not whether or not you want to or not that separates students out. This is, the problem with these people in the base of the cave is that they've got, they're looking at the wrong things and they've got disordered desires. They need to desire an education with their whole person. Because you won't succeed and get an education if you just think you can do that with your mind but desire everything else at the same time. And that's why he, he criticizes... Um, on page seven, these people with excessive attachment to sensual pleasures, too much caring about what's going on in the base of the cave, and, and, and not enough desire for, for knowledge itself. Well, some other things I think we could say here about education. One, he rejects the banking model, and instead says that students themselves have to be active. It's not a passive reception of knowledge. You, it's your education. It isn't mine. It isn't any of your other professors. It's yours. So you have to seize it. Uh, nobody can get an education for you. You have to get it for, for yourself. Now, <clears throat> one other thing we conclusion we might draw is that this will sometimes be painful for you. The, the guy escaping the cave, the guy who's getting an education, he's not always happy about what's happening. Because there's probably lots of other fun things to do, right? Other than wrestling through a passage of Kant's first critique or, or trying to understand quantum mechanics, right? I mean, sometimes that can be painful and fatiguing and all of the rest of it. But, you know, that's just, he thinks, in a certain sense, a necessary part of it. Now, one last question. The other thing he never told us who the person was is somebody came down and released the person and guided them out, sometimes dragging them when necessary. Who was that person? Any, any guesses? I mean, he doesn't say. He gives us actually very little in the way of a clue. My reading is that that person's a teacher. Uh... Socrates calls teachers, he compares a teacher to a midwife. A midwife doesn't give birth. She, it's not her pain. The sweat is not on her brow. It's, the midwife has seen a lot of people give birth. She's coached a lot of people through it. But it's not her birthing process. It's not hers. In the same way your teachers... It's not their education, it's yours. They can coach you through, tell you when to push and push and push, and it'll be painful. Sometimes tell you, ease up for a while, take a break, you've done enough of this, now move on to this other thing. Uh, but their job is to lead you somewhere, though ultimately 
Nobody can be led where they don't want to go. Nobody can be taken to a place where they don't desire to go. Uh, which it doesn't matter how great your professors are, if you don't desire an education yourself, you, you, you won't get it. Your education will be, to push the midwife analogy, aborted somewhere along the way. Um, that happens sometimes, unfortunately. I see you, Jeffrey. Um, just hold on there for just one more minute, mate, and uh, and we'll we will begin. And astronomers want you to believe that all these just came from a, something the size of a watermelon. You can't just say everything is created and then that's that. You need to have a mechanism or else it's just saying God did it. The microwave background radiation isn't some afterglow of some random Big Bang event. There's no evidence for the Big Bang at all. Big Bang is, is pseudoscience. We're stuck with people thinking that dark matter and dark energy are real things and all this other nonsense. Stars can be older than 13.7 billion years. It's not the universe that has an age, it's objects inside the universe that have ages. The universe, it has always existed. There was no beginning and there will be no end. Hi, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us. I'm Brooks Bond, and I'm chatting with my guest, researcher, author, and ex-Marine, Mr. Jeffrey Wolinski. How you doing, Jeff? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'd just like to thank you uh, for coming on to the show and letting me interview you. This is a deep honor for me personally. And uh, I think this is going to be a great show that everybody's going to be able to take something new away from. So, um, as I understand, uh, this is your first public interview to talk about your theory. And um, we here at Rotten Studios are honoured to be hosting this. Um, if anybody has any questions you'd like me to put to Jeffrey, please post them in the chat or alternatively, I'll open up the panel at the end of the interview so you can hop up and maybe speak with Jeffrey directly. So um, let's dive right in, shall we? Uh, so Jeffrey, you're an ex-Marine and in 2011, you made a discovery which you have since been developing, a theory called stellar metamorphosis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to ask, how did you go from being a, a U.S. Marine to developing a scientific theory? Did those two things link together in any way? Could you take us to the beginning and, and, and tell us what happened there? Oh, sure. Um, I've always had an interest in science and, you know, the stars and what have you. And I've also sort of been a more of a creative personality. Um, I never really took what people told me as being fact unless I put it through my own personal filter. And I think that's a good approach for a lot of people to take. Uh, unfortunately, that's sort of lost among uh, a lot of researchers and academics these days. They sort of sacrifice their own personal filter for 
you know, acceptance into a larger group and whatnot. And I see that a lot and it sort of pains me because, you know, you can easily sacrifice your own rational, uh, good judgment for, you know, acceptance and a paycheck. Mm -hmm. But uh, to really get it started off, after I, after I exited the Marines, I obviously had to get an education. I had to, you know, use my GI Bill and go to college. Um, when, when did you actually um, join the Marines? Uh, 2003, uh, July of 2003. And, and, and uh, how long was your uh, service in the Marines? Um, I was for four years, from 2003 four. to 2007. Right, and, and in that time, um, was there anything that sort of pushed you in the direction of uh, pursuing uh, things in astronomy, or, or was it something oh, yes. that kind? Yes, uh, so, uh, so yes. Um, uh, specifically, I took a course in geology at UMUC in Asia, uh, right, outside, or right inside of Camp Hansen, actually. Uh, it was a single three-semester hour geology class. And my teacher was very, uh, very, a very eclectic person. He had a lot of different interests, and he obviously liked living in Okinawa because of a lot of the geological formations there. And this uh, is this is uh, Japan that we're talking this about. Is Japan, yes. Uh, the 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 uh, little island of Okinawa is where I uh, took that geology I see. class. Uh, please continue. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, the geology class basically, you know, Earth. <laughs> Earth is an astronomical object, you know, people yeah. sort of forget that, you know, it's not just a giant rock, it's not, you know, something that, you know, just appeared out of, out of nothing, this is a astronomical object, you know, if you have people from another star system looking at us, we become mm -hmm. an astronomical object, so essentially the study of geology is the study of astronomy, if you just change your perspective. And uh, it Yes, uh, well, one of the uh, tenets of, uh, of your uh, theory that you've been developing is uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's to reconnect the sciences and, oh, yes. and, yes. and to, to bring it back down to a more fundamental level. Oh, yes, of course. And to bring it to a fundamental level, you sort of have to examine your own assumptions and your own worldview first. Before you start learning a lot of details and facts and you know, this and that and whatnot, you sort of have to examine, well, what is this thing? What are we, you know? And that those sort of questions are sort of brushed over once you, you know, you go into your basic physics classes and your chemistry classes and your biology classes. They never say, well, what is the earth exactly? Is this a giant rock? What is this thing, you know? Well, uh, if taking us from, uh, from Japan then, um, and and the studies that you're doing there so you actually have uh a degree in in this kind of thing off off the book off the uh off the hook uh so to speak well yeah my my, my actual degree that i'm getting out of two classes left is called human communication and it examines how we communicate with words like what words mean what they mean definition making and that's the central mm -hmm. part of science itself and it, you know it's called semantics but a lot of people forget the words have a lot of power. What you call something, what you define something as being, determines what it is you can see. And that's the, that's mm -hmm. the very basics. And a lot of, you know, science, science communities, they sort of, it sort of goes right over their head that their words can literally form their reality. It can form their worldview, how they view things. And I, I guess on that level, um, when... Uh, semantics and uh, and stuff aren't fully understood. That can cause understanding to sort of like veer off track, perhaps. Oh yes, big time. You know, if you if you walk around and you have two different villages, and one village calls cats dogs, and the other village calls uh, rabbits dogs, and you go say, you know, the dog is running down the road, you're not going to look at the same object. You're going to be like, that's not a dog. That's a dog over mm -hmm. there. You know, how you define the words you use. Is essential to sharing meaning with each other. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we've we have um, you know many British and American um, people coming onto these chats, and there's that same thing of like uh, you know what you call something, we call something completely different, like yeah, biscuits and gravy. An elevator, a lift, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what you, what, what you what you. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's 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 the same thing, but different terminology. But nevertheless, uh, the, in this regard, the terminology can kind of throw uh, meaning off cart, it, and it's like, uh, well, this person, these over here say this, these over here say this. Yeah, Which yeah, one do yeah. I believe? And, yeah, um, and you but, end up going like this with each other's talk with the conversation. You're just like, well, what yeah. is this guy talking about? Yeah, and, and I suppose, you know, when it when it comes to things where people are learning from such a thing, you know, and it, and it's one of the tools of, uh, of teaching um, that also can kind of muddy the waters on the definition of something. Um, now, um, this, uh, this theory, um, this uh, stellar metamorphosis, can you tell us um, what exactly is stellar metamorphosis well, uh, what is it what is it yes it's just uh, a theory of, it's a theory it's a theory that states that stellar evolution is the process of planet formation and how does that work exactly well the the main issue is as we said earlier is with the words we use scientists and observers that lived way 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 thousands of years ago the ancient greeks when they were looking up at the stars those were the fixed luminous points and the points in the night sky that moved were the planets the wandering stars right um, so then that's when it all started when they started saying well the ones that wander are the planets and the ones that are staying put are the stars um fast forward a few hundreds of years thousands of years mm -hmm. we still use that ancient greek terminology but it's horrendously outdated because the wandering stars not only are they wandering around a larger host but they're also old stars and that sort of subtracts it when you define a planet as being something independent of the young planets which are called stars you sort of take your mind and you separate the two in your head and then you look out at it and say oh well that's a planet and that's a star little you got to realize that what you're observing is the planet isn't something independent of the star the planet is the old star you're looking at old stars and the stars are the young planets but uh, a lot of people they look they don't they don't examine that for what it really is they don't because there are a lot of assumptions there and then what happened is over the years we started to make facts and things mm -hmm. that support that assumption and then it started piling on and before you know it we have a completely obscure reality where we have entire models of star evolution that are completely independent of the old stars and then we have old stars forming completely in weird ways and that involve discs and weird things like that when reality it's it's the same process the, the stars as they evolve they cool and collapse and become what we call the planets but they're not they're not independent things yeah, I see. we can thank the ancient greeks for that problem so so uh, with with semantics um we, we can we can say that that may have had a big influence on the uh misunderstanding of stars and planets um uh, but just um, from what you're saying, to clarify to our listeners, what you're saying is um, that stellar evolution, uh, the, the, basically the evolution of a star, or, or the metamorphosis of a star, is the process of planet formation. Yes. And, um, and how did you, uh, can you, can you tell us how you made this initial discovery? Oh, that's easy, yes. Mm -hmm. um, on September 3rd, 2011 I was on the stellar evolution page now originally I've been fascinated with the uh, with gravitation how why things fall why you know all that happens you know why do, why do things fall like this is the strangest thing right mm -hmm. and I completely rejected uh, general relativity I don't I don't think Einstein was correct in general relativity thinking space-time warping I, I don't think that's that's a good description or explanation of gravity so that being said, I was looking for answers and I thought, well, what are the most gravitationally or, or pulling objects in the universe? Is the, and, and the numerous stars, those are the ones we should be looking at to try to figure out how gravity works because they have the strongest gravity. So then I went to the Stylo mm -hmm. Evolution page and I scrolled down and I saw that little onion-like layered star where they have it listed as a 
um, a highly evolved star just before core collapse. And it has the layers. It has the oxygen or the uh, hydrogen, helium on the outside. It has the mm -hmm. oxygen and the neon and the magnesium and the silicon and the carbon and the iron and the core in the very center. And it's layered just like an onion. And back from my geology class in Okinawa many, many years ago, 2004, as seven years have passed, I was like, wait a second. Those are the layers of the Earth. And then it hit me. The Earth is the remains of an extremely old star. And I thought, well, how can that how can that be? That means there would be stars in intermediate sizes. There would be stars that between the size of the sun and the earth. And I was like, oh, crap. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. And then all these exoplanets started rolling in. They're all in between the sizes of the sun and the earth, too. And it's like, well, there you have it. It's a it's a smooth continuum. So so when you uh, when you made that initial discovery, how did it make you feel? Uh, what was going through your mind? Originally, within the first five minutes, I was like, holy crap, did I just make a major scientific discovery? I was like, I'm, wow, I can't believe I just, I think, it, it wasn't, I, I was sure of myself, it was, I can't, did, did I really, do, did I just really do something really important? I was like, what What just happened right now? What did I just do? And then it was like, uh-oh. And then I closed the laptop, and I got up off the couch, and I started to walk down the road outside the house. And I was like thinking it over, thinking it over, like, oh my gosh, what does this really mean? What is all this? And then I just sat on it for like a good week and didn't say anything or do anything. And eventually I was like, okay, I have to do something about this. And I started to write down a lot of ideas and a lot of things for how it would work. And, you know, because I've already taken geology. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, well, I was just about to say your previous uh, c uh, school in, in geology, uh, I would have uh, imagined that had a, a big um, impact on your understanding of this, uh, at least uh, from a, a scientific perspective of like, well, how how is this differentiation occurring? Why is it, why is it present in, in all stars of different stages of evolution? So um with that um it's i i i i can imagine it must have been a bit of a shock to you it was very shocking yes it's still shocking to the, to this day when i sort of understand that the, this atmosphere that we're breathing in is the remains of a very very old star stellar atmosphere we're, we're still breathing in the atmosphere of an ancient star we're we're when we swim in the oceans we're swimming in material that has taken hundreds of millions of years to form yeah where this place is so so freakishly old that it's just it's mind-blowing i can't even i can't do it justice by myself <laughs> well um you've been busy writing a book um uh there's there's that minute, minute uh, i think uh, uh version five so far um yeah, five, and, yeah. and 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 uh, th that's like a, a consolidation of some of the separate papers that you've been working on since, uh, was it since 2011 when, um, when you started writing papers or was it a little bit afterwards? Yeah, 20, 2011 is when I was just sort of feeling it out because right. what, ha what happens is, is when you make, for those that might make a major discovery that might be listening to this, uh, it, it's not it's not as clear cut as, as as it may seem. It isn't like well you make a discovery and then oh it, it all fits. The problem that I faced is that I made a discovery and I found so many things that did not fit. I found so many ideas that were wrong. I felt I found so many assumptions that were wrong. I felt there's a litany of ideas out there that are all misguided based off this new understanding. And sorting all that out and finding out where it's all wrong and right it. It was like, I, I, yeah, I, I did find that uh, reading through some of your papers that um, many times I, I see that you're not just uh, developing your theory, but you're sort of like clearing up uh, a lot of mis misconceptions in, in science. Um, it's like a garden, it's like a good analogy, it's a garden is overgrown with weeds and those weeds mm -hmm. have thorns on them. So you have to be careful, you know, you have to like pluck them out carefully. Yeah. And, and, and I guess just on that level, it makes the job doubly hard 
to 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 build something because first you got to sweep away all all the uh, the rubble and, and stuff so you got a nice flat yeah. level to to it's like mining for gold is what it is you, you have a yeah. lot of rocks to dig through before you actually get to the gold yeah and um, well you are after all a geologist of sorts so <laughs> you're in the right place I would imagine <laughs> okay so um um no uh, I I know I spoke to you before we, we we had this interview and I, and I said I didn't want to play too many videos but since we've now spoken um, of, of what stellar, stellar metamorphosis is uh, you do have a video which shows uh, in a sort of detail of, of, of what you're referring to with stellar metamorphosis now would you like me to play that video it's about seven minutes long uh, it's one of your it's one of your main videos uh, to um, that that it shows what what's actually happening to a star as it evolves, and and I think for our viewers it it'd be, be it'd be good for them to see a visual depiction of that to, okay. to play. All right. Would you yeah, be would, sure. would, would you be okay with that? Right. Yeah, okay. okay. Go for it. Let, let me just um, let me just pull up on on here. All right. I'm just gonna mute my cam for just a moment. Okay, here we go. Earth was shaped by the same processes in operation today. Charles Lyell and James Hutton were correct. It is ancient almost beyond measure. But why? This video should serve as an explanation to that why. The present is key to the past, and much more is written in the sky than in the rocks. Electromagnetic phenomena in a galaxy's spiral arms causes planetary nebula to form. Planetary nebula, also known as supernovas, birth white dwarf stars via Z-pinch, forming an object that has had its electrons removed, becoming electron degenerate matter which is extremely dense. To dissipate the heat of birthing, the white dwarf will begin to expand and cool via thermal expansion. The white dwarf remains homogeneous as it expands and sputters as nova events, which are caused by incoming material adding electrons which then combine with the electron degenerate matter, forming stable elements. There are no iron cores formed in the early stages of stars. They are composed mostly of highly ionized, charged particles, and do not have any significant chemical or physical differentiation. After expanding as big as it can, the star will begin cooling and contracting, the plasma and ions will begin neutralizing into gaseous matter. There is no global magnetic field yet. There are multiple magnetic fields which loop around inside the surface of the star only. The strongest chemical bonds begin forming at the white star stage of development. Chemical reactions in the surface begin to rain down and are convected through the star's interior. As this heavier material moves towards the center, the star will continue to gravitationally collapse, converting gravitational potential energy to heat and light energy, which is both trapped internally and radiated away. This, in addition to mass loss, causes the star to contract more. Chemical synthesis speeds up during the yellow star stage. Strong chemical bonds continue forming in the star surface as well are subsequently ejected due to mass loss, as small molecules such as water, hydroxide, or any type of strong ionic or covalently bonded ion or molecule can escape. More chemical bonds continue to form and rain down into the orange dwarf and change in density, equilibrium, and composition. As the plasma undergoes exothermic reactions, it continues to combine into neutral gas and continues to lose this gas to flares and solar wind. The iron nickel core will begin forming at the star center. 
a global magnetic field begins dominating the star. When a star has cooled beyond its plasmatic state, it will be subject to mass loss, resulting from solar radiation and ablation effects of younger, hotter stars. The core continues to grow, but there is still no chemical differentiation in the region between the core and the outer supercritical gas layers. The thick helium and hydrogen atmosphere will continue to dissipate. Heavier molecules formed in earlier stages of evolution will begin raining down into the star composed of hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and magnesium. The internal regions previously undifferentiated now begin to differentiate by the weights of supercritical silicates and aluminum compounds which are really hot and highly pressurized. This is also the stage with which hydrogen starts combining with oxygen in large amounts forming water deep in the interior of the star. By the Grey Dwarf stage, the iron nickel core is fully developed. The first layer surrounding the core is still a supercritical fluid, comprised of silicates, sulfides, and minerals like pyroxene and tribersite. The inner layers are composed of supercritical nitrides, nitrates, and carbonates, as well as much larger amounts of highly pressurized water. The outer layer consists of hydrogen and helium, hydroxides, oxides, etc. Now the central core begins cooling. The star will be a lot colder on the outside and will start radiating less and less. The surface of the developing Earth begins to form on the hot central core. Surrounding the core is a layer of supercritical water and hydrogen compounds, oxygen and nitrogen. The outer layers are composed of ammonia and a wide range of hydrocarbon compounds such as methane, ethane, propane, butane, etc. that rain down with increasing pressure towards its lower regions. Diamonds also form in the atmosphere which rain down and deposit in the newly forming crust of the core alongside the hydrocarbon rains, in some cases, which were formed from a type of chemical vapor deposition process. Compounds continue to form and rain down to the mantle's newly forming outer crust, leaving behind a thick ocean of water and huge land masses which are still in magma form, such as basaltic and granitic magmas. The deep crustal magmas begin crystallizing in layers and folding, mixing and trapping the previous hydrocarbons and diamonds that were rained down from previous stages, forming the outer crust of the emerging Earth. When oxygen begins to dominate the atmosphere, it paves the way for plant life to emerge and eventually insects, aquatic, and mammalian life forms. As the heat escapes, the solidification of the interior deepens, the crust begins thickening, and the core becomes comparatively larger. The CO2 builds up in an acidic atmosphere, and the ocean life dies due to the pH being about 4, while the magnetic field dissipates and the oceans evaporate. All life dies. With no protective magnetic shield, ancient black dwarf stars will have their outer rocky layers continually ablated away by stellar radiation, leaving behind the thick mantle and eventually the solid iron nickel core which formed in the star's younger, hotter stages. The dead star will wander the galaxy, smashing into other dead stars and stellar guts, creating meteoroids and asteroids. Wow, <laughs> that was quite impressive. No, and and that essentially is the result of um, ten years almost of development work to to bring this in front of people. And um, I, I suppose when you when now you're at that level, I think now is as good a time as any. But there's there's um, there's a lot of things that you can take away from that. Which um, you know, one of the things that I saw was. Um, the the theory of stellar metamorphosis. It's uh, it's um, is it would I be right to say that it's purely um, chemi chem chemistry and thermodynamics uh, of that nature? Well, yeah, um, some large concepts to to study it that would be good for you to um, to get a grasp of it. But yeah, thermodynamics, uh, flu fluid dynamics. And here's a big one, 
magneto hydrodynamics. So that's or electromagneto hydrodynamics. So that's the uh, idea that magnetic and electrical forces play a large role in fluid motion. And also there's thermochemistry, which is the uh, heat released or absorbed during chemical reactions. And there's also electrochemistry. So there's electrical interactions that occur while chemistry is occurring. Uh, think of like lightning. Lightning uh, uh, would be a lot. There's a lot of electrochemistry with regards to lightning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there, and just just to look at just to look at stellar evolution in those uh, more uh, visceral terms rather than the exotic. Oh, well, this is a fusion reaction, or you know, whatever. According to the B two page paper uh, by uh, the Ho the Hoyles and uh, mm -hmm. Fred Hoyle and uh, I can't remember their name. Fred, gosh, I can't remember. I, I think I think it was Fred Hoyle. Uh, Fred he, Hoyle. He, yeah. he 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 comes in. Margaret, Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage is what it was. Yeah, the B two page paper. But that's what yeah. kicked, that's what kicked off the uh, the, the fusion belief uh, sort of mentality, and they really you know went off the deep end and just completely made a stellar auras world which totally ignores old stars which are you know disabled planets well, well one of the important things that you say in there is um I, I know you've said this in some of your other videos too is that you consider the uh the energies of the universe to be uh, a constant ebb and flow without beginning and or, or end um and with that um you uh, you don't um, consider Big Bang uh, a, a, a cosmology in this regard as to be well, anything. Yeah, uh, uh, cosmology. Cosmology isn't science. Right. Well, because this it, it more or less involves mm. things that can't be observed, and that's not scientific. Well, uh, now we've shown um, our listeners uh, what stellar metamorphosis is, and 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 there's more to discuss of how it contrasts. Um, to other theories. Uh, this does bring me nicely to my next question, which is, uh, what are your thoughts on mainstream academia's views of stars and planets? Well, I like to believe that they already understand what's going on. But at the same time, there's heavy po there are heavy politics going on in academics. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that wholeheartedly now. I, I used to think that, you know, they were, you know, being more sinister and they didn't want, you know, the truth out or whatever. But I sort of learned that you can't speak up and, 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 and publish ideas that go against what everybody else already believes to be true. Or else you can't have a career in academics. It's case in point. There's no way to actually go out on your own and get funding when you have an idea that everybody you know thinks is wrong it's just you're not going to have a career you have to go along with what everybody else says is true regardless of if it's misguided well so concern uh, sort of yeah the, yeah that's sort uh, of the, the direction they're taking concerning um uh things like uh, accretion disks uh, uh the planet formation of just collecting together you don't believe any of that you, well you know? the, the concept of accretion disk actually came from I think the early 1900s, there was a big uh, there was a big um, argument, the formalized argument. I think there was a debate versus the mm -hmm. island universe theory and uh, and and close in nebula theory. So basically, what what happened in the early 1900s before you know Hubble came around and showed that a galaxy is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars, mm -hmm. those disc shaped objects that we were viewing in the telescopes. The astronomers thought they were localized, uh, localized, that they were forming solar systems. And that's where the original nebular hypothesis came from. But once Hubble came around and found those cephalid variables and proved that, you know, the galaxies were millions of light years distant from us, the nebular hypothesis was never tossed in the trash can. They just sort of kept the idea that a disk forms solar systems and they never realized that that idea was falsified by realizing those disks were entire galaxies. So the sciences just weren't like that, like this. You know, you had the cosmologists and you had your people that study the, that study the actual, the actual stars themselves and their spectrums. 
So you went like this. Con concerning accretion, you believe that uh, accretion doesn't happen without a star in the first place. Well, yeah, the, the process of, 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 a, of an object collecting material is uh, dependent upon that star having a gravitational field. You can't collect material if you don't have anything to pull it in. And, and we do see that uh, with these accretion di uh, disks or circumstellar disks, there's, they're in a gravitational field, but they don't, all those individual pieces don't have a gravitational field of their own. They're, they're so more, more uh, reacting to one rather than having one. No, it's 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 Newton's law. The every every if a, a body in motion stays in motion, there's I think there's three three of those. I, I believe I can't remember off the top of my head, but a body in motion stays in motion. If you're to see a disc, okay, then you have to suppose that there's something that's going to pull a disc together somehow. Now, what object is pulling a disc together? Okay, if you have an object, if you have a disc that's like flat. And it's mm -hmm. all orbiting, you know, a central object. What is it that's taking that object way over here and pulling it in if it's already in orbit around the central object? You see, you have to, you have to give another mechanism there to clump it all together. You have to impose some, something additional. You have to make it ad hoc hypothesis. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, I do, I do recall watching one of your videos where it shows the material clumping together is how mainstream uh, academic academia would describe it and then it then it melts into a ball without any mechanism to melt yeah, in the yeah. first <laughs> I, I, and i can I, I i'm totally behind with what you're saying here because uh, the logistics of it would say that could never happen so what's going on okay. here well it's easy it's, e it's easy to do a simple experiment or demonstration as you say if you ever played pool you know when the cue ball hits the triangle of, 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 of the number balls, it, it yes. dissipates. Yes. What the astronomer is essentially saying is if you hit the cue ball and all the other number balls all over the table, if you hit the cue ball, then all the number balls will form a triangle. So you see it you see how backwards that is? It, it, it is back to front thinking uh, when you describe it like that. And and I can see um, as you know, as a researcher, um, I, I can see your train of thought, you know, in in looking at things in a in a in a logical way and determining whether what they're teaching is right or wrong. Uh, and it's, they they think of things in, in backwards terms is what's happening. Right. Okay. So, um, I mean, this this whole th I, I I guess it would uh, equate to dogma, um, and and there's many forms of dogma in the science community but with respect to the astronomical community um, can you give us some other examples of what you would consider as dogma uh, that is still being pushed at the moment concerning there's a lot there's a lot of it out there there's a lot um, with respect to say star evolution uh, uh, or, or at least uh, just well, it, the, main, maybe. the main dogma with star evolution is the fact that scientists, when they look up at the stars, they say, well, you know, because they measure the light, they measure the star spectrum to figure out what's what's in the spectrum to study the star. In other words, it has to be basically bright. But the problem is, is when you study the old ones, they don't have spectrums because they've stopped shining. See, see where that yeah. see where that gets them? Mm -hmm. And they never considered that, that the most of the old stars don't shine. They never considered that. They considered the all stars shine. So that's sort of a, a dogmatic assumption that I don't think it's ever going to be shaken because they've already bulwarked it. They've already supported it with this with these fusion models that you know yeah. accurately represent how stars actually evolve. Well, you know, I, I suppose you could say that we should cut them some slack to a point uh, because you know knowledge it comes slow uh, and it's a slow process to gather the information mm -hmm. however it, it seems to me that somewhere along the, the line mainstream astronomy uh, took a wrong turn and started making mistake after mistake after mistake um, can I ask you um, where do you think it 
probably started where where the train started coming off the off the track. Really off the track was when mm. they started making the particle colliders. Could you explain? Well, I don't remember the exact history, but a lot of researchers, when we started to make nuclear nuclear weapons, we figured out you know how to split the atom. Right. And then science was sort of like, well, you know, are there smaller pieces? You know, so let's just make these bigger and bigger colliders and smash atoms together and to see what kind of particles come out of those. And then they just sort of whew, went off the deep end. And I think uh, what's her name, Sabrina Hofstetter? I don't want to say her, I don't want to say her name wrong or whatever, but she doesn't believe that we should make an even larger particle collider. Because there, there, there's nothing to gain from it. It's sort of lost its it's lost its meaning. Like, well, what what is it to make uh, a machine that can smash atoms more and more and more and more and more? What do you get? You just get a um, a money pit, basically. And yeah. That started with the with the fusion people. Once we figured out how to make nuclear weapons, everything sort of went off the tracks. We were like. Oh well, nuclear this and nuclear this and nuclear this and nuclear is going to save the world. Nuclear is going to do this. Nuclear is going to do that. And we learned there are limits to, to nuclear energy. We learned that you know there's a lot more to it than what meets the eye. But unfortunately, the nuclear people were working down the hall from the astrophysics people. So you know they went to lunch together. They would study the same high energy phenomenon together. And they yeah. sort of intermingled with one another. And then the nuclear people convinced the astrophysics community that they started the fusion reactors. And that's when they sort of lost that's when they sort of lost their way was back when, you know, nuclear energy started to go, you know, full blast and you know, we decided yeah. we, we could figure out how to make how to refine the uh, um, plutonium and so, know, make bombs and stuff. So so on that basis, uh, because we discovered how to make nuclear weapons they equated the stars as nuclear powered, but it, it, it went along with the times. In other words, you know, when you're, when you're burning things for fuel, like with wood and coal, they viewed the sun as being, you know, a large campfire. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we figured out that, well, gravity is a thing. So then it became with, uh, I think, Hem Hemholtz, Kel I Hemholtz. Know, Kelvin or, um, he, he figured that, you know, when the whole thing c contracts on itself, the gravitational collapse is what produces the star's energy. And, you know, we had that idea for a little while. And that came along with the time. And then the nuclear people came around and were like, well, you know, it's fashionable to make everything as uh, centered around what we study. And then the sun became a, a fusion reactor, a large fusion process. And sort of the stars become, they sort of mirrored what was in fashion, what we considered important to us, where the money would go for our own researchers and our own, you know, worldview about how, how the universe works. So um, clearly they were looking at the stars, yeah. what they actually were. It was, they, they represented what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can, can I mean, is there? I mean, what was the uh, what was the date of when they started developing nuclear weapons? Um, what what time scale are we looking at there? Well, yeah, I mean, back in the um, what was the nineteen twenties, nineteen twenties, the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties. So, so middle of the the, uh, the century, um, sort of. So, so since then, uh, the uh, dogma, I, I suppose you would say, has compounded over the well, yeah. years. And it, it's, it, it's, it's a garden overgrown with weeds, with uh, ideas that are unnecessary and we don't, they don't accurately represent the observations. In, um, in your opinion then, because uh, we know that they still teach um, older astronomy um things in in schools and colleges in your opinion why do they continue to push this dogma um could it be for religious or political motivations well from, or, what, I under, from what i understand uh, i had a friend who's a, a physics professor he was told that he had to teach certain things it was a requirement by the state 
the state, you know, this is what you have to teach your kids. This is what you have to like make sure that they know. And it was sort of a, uh, um, a mandate, if you will, or regulations or, you know, as a, as a physics professor at a college, you can't sit there and be like, all right, kids, you know, throw your book away. This is what's actually going on because then, you know, they'll write letters to people and say, well, I learned it like this and I learned it like that. And then, you know, the teacher, they, they, their career is in jeopardy because they'll, they'll get letters and they'll be like, well, they're teaching wrong information. We have to fire this teacher because, you know, mm -hmm. the state requires that we teach this information. So it's really something you have to take upon yourself to learn. You can't expect the state to, to, to educate you. You have to do a sort of self-education in a way. And that's, that's exactly why I'm doing this is there are some people out there that can educate themselves and can think for themselves and they don't need, uh, uh, well, I mean, daddy's uh, state to tell them what to believe and how to think. I, I would agree with that sentiment exactly because in this day and age, anybody who's got access to the internet mm -hmm. can teach themselves. Um, uh, and, and it does, uh, I do find it confusing that, it, I mean, uh, what, for whatever reason, establishment push uh, outdated dogma, they nevertheless they are doing so. Uh, the where's and why falls for that 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 can uh, I don't think has an answer <laughs> to, yeah. to, to well, one degree or another. Because like, uh, like, uh, my dad now used to say, we say it as well. You got to follow the money. Yeah, so 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 funding, I guess, is a, is a big funding. part of this. Funding and people are very social creatures. We don't like to be, you know, outcasts. So you know, it's safe to even if you know what's actually going on, you know, you keep your head low so you make sure you don't stick out and you can. You know, yeah, have a career doing whatever it is you want to do. Um, um, so, how 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 does um, then that um, your theory? How does it compare to um, other theories of uh, stellar evolution? Um, uh, other existing theories. Um, uh, I mean, I'd I'd like to ask you what are you what are your thoughts on other things like. Um, uh, flat Earth, Electric Universe. Do do any of the components of those theories tie into stellar metamorphosis or not? Well, Flat Earth is very interesting um, because we navigate our lives with the idea that this is flat, and we all know it's a giant ball. Okay, I'm not going to argue for that because you know there's yeah. so much hate online. But our daily lives, we can go ahead and navigate the Earth as being flat for the most part. When we build buildings, we make the assumption this is a flat piece of land. You know, when we build buildings, when we design architecture, mm -hmm. we don't go, well, why don't we build this building? And now I have to make sure it goes like this. So unless you're like, you know, building bridges or stuff like that, and you get surveys to see that the earth is kind of curving like that on, yeah. a, on a larger scale. But besides that, I don't, I don't see any real future with that type of idea that's saying the earth is flat. I don't, I don't see that going anywhere. I just, it's just, I thought it was, honest mm -hmm. to God, I thought it was just people trolling. I thought it was trolling, people trolling a lot of others. And I didn't know that there were people that actually take that seriously. And in all honesty, I didn't know. Um, Electric Universe, uh, I, I originally, when I first had this idea, I went to them to try to like say, well, listen, this is, this is, this is, a, this is a very new understanding. I'm still working it out. Can you guys help me out? Is there any way to get this, you know, some attention? Yeah. And then I got sort of like stonewalled with with regards to that because I didn't like what they were, you know, saying about how Venus is supposedly ejected from Jupiter. And I had big beef with that because it was like we have a hard enough time getting a, a, a simple rocket off the Earth. <laughs> and to say something the size of, of the Earth, which is Venus is about the size of the Earth, is ejected out of Jupiter, like Jupiter must have some really thick. That's got a very powerful object. <laughs> but you gotta realize that that's. I don't so, know. so, so you don't believe that one planet can sneeze <laughs> another planet into existence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't. Some people take it seriously. They do, but I mean, I just look at it and I go, well. If Jupiter can sneeze Venus, then that means Jupiter can sneeze Earth, Enceladus, Io, you know, and Jupiter is sneezing all these objects everywhere. Well, what about the sun? 
what was it doing? And what about Saturn? Does mm. that, why, why isn't Saturn a part of this? And does this apply to all the exoplanets and all the other systems, all the highly evolved stars? Do they all do that too? And what stage does this happen in? And, you know, it's just, there's so many other things that would go with it. There's just like, it, that doesn't fit anywhere. It's like a, I don't know. It's like, it's mm-hmm. like you have a puzzle and then you find a, a half eaten cheeseburger on the ground and you're like, oh, a half eaten cheeseburger goes right in the puzzle piece right here. <laughs> Um, well, we, we briefly touched on the uh, the nebula hypothesis, which is, um, I suppose, a kind of accretion. It's more to do with the solar system formation, uh, and uh, again, uh, you in, in the the thing of uh, a formation of a, a solar system is is a little bit different in in your model of stellar evolution. Um, would you like Would you like to just uh, touch on that a, a little a little bit, and then just okay. well uh, to first understand the all the objects in our system are all various various ages. They're all they're all, they're all a lot older than than each other, and they're all independent of each other. So to say that there is a solar system is to assume that all these objects all formed at the same time in the current configurations, the current orbital configurations, and their current size and the current level of differentiation, what that does is sort of remove them from their actual evolutionary history. How did they get to how they, their physical structure, how did they get that? And you can't explain that with nebula father. There's nothing that can explain why the Earth has a giant iron core, why Mercury, Venus, and Mars all have giant iron cores. There's nothing in there that can explain that. There's nothing in the nebula hypothesis that can explain why these objects are separated by billions of kilometers. Why are they so far away? Why wouldn't they just be close in if they're all formed in a big disk? Why are they way the hell out there? And that's, it's a completely different world view. And yeah, I mean, we, we know that um, stars and planets have gravitational fields uh, and that does, uh, that does pose the question, well, well, what's happened there? Why are they so far apart? And yeah, why, are they, uh, why are they separated by billions of kilometers of empty space? You know, if they outform them, they just what? Why, why are they so far away from each other? It takes it takes light. It takes light four hours to get to Pluto from the sun, and that's travel light speed. It takes light four oh. hours to get there. You can't tell me that all these objects formed in a disk when Pluto it takes four light hours to get there. That's a long, 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 long distance away. Well, yeah, the um, the uh, the size of uh, the galaxy, let alone the universe, uh, I think it's beyond the imagination of any person on this planet. And uh, so, uh, and and I think that's an important point to make because trying trying to understand the big the big questions. Um, do you think we'll ever get to that? I mean, no. The universe is beyond everybody combined together. Um. W- we, I, yeah, I suppose we can we can uh, describe what we do see. Uh, we can describe what we do see, but the large the largest picture we're never going to be able to even come close. No, this place actually. is just too big. It's just too old. Um, okay, well, in 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 contrast then to um, the uh, the other theory other theories that we've talked about, um, just to mention again uh, the. Um, the fundamental base uh, of stellar metamorphosis is uh, thermodynamics and chemistry. So, um, Both of this the things all together. Uh-huh. Uh It it kind of points towards like a like a an infinite kind of thing. But is is the universe a contained thing? Um, I don't believe it is. I think it stretches out into infinity. There's no end. There's no beginning, there's no end in both time and space. It's timeless, it's eternal, and it's limitless. There is no edge to the universe. You see, that is a mind blower. <laughs> uh, just just to even try and get that concept into the mind, it's like, boom. It, it, it makes people uncomfortable. They're like, what do you mean there's no edge? What do you mean there's no... If, well, you think about it, think about it. If there is an edge, well, what's on the other side? There's a boundary. What is that boundary to? You know, there's that would be that would mean there's even more. You know what I'm saying? So there's not. 
yeah, I, I suppose we'd, um, we'd have to just start defining reality with numbers. Um, but as science has proven, that's not a really good idea because it takes us to places where it's they can generally make things up and totally get lost in the source. As, yeah, it's, as easy, it's easy to just lose track of everything because it's just such a big place. That's why people that, you know, they, they say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a cosmologist. It's like, really, you, you can imagine all of the universe? I highly doubt that. Yeah, um, I, I, I think I would agree. Uh, um, so um, to move this into another, another gear, um, you know, so so you've been spending quite quite a few years developing this theory. Um, what do you, what have you found has been the general response to this? Uh, you know, from people who who might have a, a particular preference for any other um, theory or precedent out there. Well, the, gen um, the general the general response the general response is uh, initial disbelief because it's 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 not that they think that it's wrong it's just that they never been introduced to it before so naturally you know you see something that's had that it's brand new your natural reaction is like what is this this is confusing you know and like that one lecture video it's like you shouldn't be mad at people for being confused but at the same time the general response is people who tend to be confused and tend to think that they already already understand how things work they tend to be the ones who are very angry with me. So I have to sort of take that into account that this idea makes people very, very upset because it conflicts with what they already believe to be true. Do you find that general reaction um, to be in equal doses from, say, armchair scientists to full-blown academics? Uh, oh, full-blown academics don't want anything to do with it. They're perfectly happy, you know, getting paid, believing whatever it is they want to believe and dealt with anybody who, you know, should threaten their own worldview. Mm -hmm. The people who really uh, get it are people who have not been conditioned into a specific worldview that they still have what I like to call a transcendent mind. Uh, you know, look at the universe through the eyes of a five-year-old, like as if you're seeing it for the first time, you know. Mm -hmm. But academics, they already know what they know and to hell with everybody else so there's no real teaching them anything unless you know it goes along with what they already believe to be true and that's that's frustrating in a sense because you think that you know with more education you would get more ability to you know question your own beliefs but it's exactly the opposite the more education you get the less likely you are to question your own assumptions and, and your own beliefs mm -hmm. um Okay, um, so uh, I mean, what 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 are the biggest difficulties then that you've faced? Because I, I can imagine, um, you know, with people in opposition uh, and you, and pulling together information. Um, beyond that, though, I mean, what what's what's what are the biggest difficulties that you've faced in developing this theory? The biggest the biggest difficulties uh, it changed over the years. In the beginning, the biggest difficulty was teasing out some a lot of the wrong ideas mm -hmm. and sort of conflicting with my own educational background. Like there were some ideas that I had accepted to be true that were completely false. And it was very psychologically you know, painful because it you know, involved a lot of cognitive dissonance. But over time, I sort of, you know, that outweighed and then I moved on to the next, uh, to the next level. And the next level was sort of just trying to get some feedback on the idea from people. And mm -hmm. that was a very difficult part in itself because then not only was it me and my cognitive dissonance that I had to actually work through, it was another person's cognitive dissonance. And that was something that I could not control at all. So I just had to throw the idea out there. And if somebody got it, good. If they didn't, then there's nothing I could do. I couldn't force them to try to make it make sense to them. So, so initially, um, in the early stages, um, it it was it was sort of a, a battle, if you will, uh, not between well, uh, between um, 
someone else's preconceived uh, idea about something. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's a difficult thing to to change in someone's mind, um, and and I suppose that then is what led you down the path of well, well here's the evidence, you know, the information's readily available to all of us, and all you got to do is pull everything together, and and, and, if, and they do it, if they do it on their own, then that's that. If they don't do it, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, I I I I've <laughs> I do have a. Um, after watching um, some things on peer the peer review system, it's uh, it's it's not it's detrimental to progress. Um, from what we've, I like to call it a double-edged sword. On one yeah. hand, you know you can get a lot of good research out there, and you know get the get the ideas out there, like you know the discovery of the older older stars through the Kepler and the test space telescopes. Yeah. On the other, on the the other side of that sword is, it sort of crushes all of the scent. The the ideas that might actually make sense are sort of, you know, pushed out, and those authors are sort of you know, shunned by those larger communities. So it sort of perpetuates an idea, regardless if if it's correct or not. It it doesn't it doesn't have any bounds for the the, the peer review stamp. In other words. It's not what people think it is at all. Well, on the flip side of that, uh, you know, the, obviously there's difficulties in developing anything. Um, what are your greatest achievements so far? That, at least to you, as a as an individual, uh, while developing this, what what are the biggest achievements that you have with this so far? The one, the one that means the one that means the most to, the, to me concerning this theory is the understanding of what the earth is so so it's a very uh grassroots kind of thing to to, yeah, to know that, that's to yeah. know what i'm to know what i'm standing on something i've always wondered is, as a kid like what is the earth why is this thing here you know what is this thing it's, uh -huh. it's as simple <laughs> as that what are rocks like why are these hard objects all over the place what are mountains like why are these even here and the understanding that this is the remains of an extremely old star that just it solves my 12 year old curiosity to it. it it fits it perfectly i'm like okay i'm i'm satisfied with that now yeah i mean to to look up at the moon uh and be aware of this theory and and to consider that that is the core of a dead star i mean very 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 old dead star core mm -hmm. it, it it just you sort of re question a lot of things in your life, don't you? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I mean, another big one, another really big one. This is number two big ones. Uh, life, the chemistry, the the energy to create life comes directly from a star itself. So the star, you know, the energy transformations of a star as it collapses are what fuels the chemistry required to to make life happen. And if you bring that to its rational conclusion, all those little dots in the night sky, those are young Earths. And they have the possibility of becoming just like this one, which means, you know, these people walk around their surface very, very far into the future as well. And also means, well, if Earth is here and this process is ubiquitous across the entire galaxy, there absolutely have to be more civilizations out there just like ours. Well, as, as you rightly said, um if the universe is infinite and there are innumerable galaxies out there with the same processes going on as what's happening in this galaxy, um, then could, could we say then that the entire universe is alive uh, and not just this part of it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know that part in Men in Black? In the very end, the first Men in Black movie, mm -hmm. where the it zooms out, zooms out, zooms out, and then you see the Milky Way as a galaxy, and it's like a marble, and then these yeah. aliens are flicking it, and then they put it in the bag, and then it zooms out even more, and you're like, you know, like what well, what is really going on here? Like, <laughs> yeah, I I, out there. I I do believe it was the uh, was it the, was it the second or the third movie at the end when he opens the locker. 
and there's those little little men, yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 he's like, why do you let them believe that stuff? And Tommy Lee Jones he goes, still a rookie, <laughs> you know, because it's like it's like worlds within worlds within worlds, and within worlds, yeah. I, I and I know that's that's that like a sci-fi fantasy kind of stuff, but nevertheless, the basic tenets come back into the real world i i would think and uh so so it, it's not like a full circle well, actually if you want to look at it like this i mean from a biological standpoint we're made of you know billions of cells and each one of those cells is alive independently of other cells i mean and they're all making this work like yeah one of, <laughs> one of the one of the things that i found fascinating about your work was the formation of oceans in on a star, do you know this, a star makes its own oceans? And oh, yeah, this the, the, ocean, the oceans are oxygen combined with hi, with hydrogen. It's, it's uh, H2O. And and we know for a fact that the sun has a lot of hydrogen in it. It has a lot of hydrogen and it has a lot of oxygen. It's going to make oceans very 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 late into its evolution. And um, yeah, um, just I'm I'm going to make a point to our listeners that in the in the description of this video are a lot of Jeffrey's links, uh, there's links to his papers, uh, his YouTube channel, um, I, uh, a few other sites. Um, so I, I would recommend that everybody check out those links um, because this is uh, what Jeffrey's been working on. It is a huge body of work and um, it'll probably keep you going as long as it's taken him to write up. <laughs> um, but um, with that, um, I'd like to ask you, Jeff, because uh, you're still continuing. It's it's an ongoing process. It's it's kind of like a, a never-ending thing for you. Um, well, because it... my um, my my uh, my my game plan is sort of sort of morphed into uh, just stick around until the the dogma implodes on itself, and then they're going to be like, oh, well, we did everything wrong quick search for the ideas that actually make sense and that's when it's gonna it's gonna take quite a few more years I'll, I'll be honest with you but uh it's definitely i got i got a lot of it out there and people can read as much as they want or disagree or you know a lot yeah, of you, people will be really angry with me but you know you, 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 you you've covered a lot of material though uh, i mean the contents of your book um, the <laughs> the amount of different chapters that you've got listed, um, and and you're still going with it. So um, with that, um, I, I'd like to ask you, what have you been working on most recently with this theory? What where where's your attention been? My, just my recently? attention is my attention right now is just going to lay lay back, to lay low, and just um, take it easy on it. Um, with personally, with my own life, I have a lot of other big projects that I'm doing, so I've sort of uh, been taking a, a big, big, big break on it. But um, yeah, I think I might come back to it every now and then in the, in the future and write up uh, an idea or two. But I really think that I can't do it more justice. I think it's time for a lot of other people to step up to the plate and to mm -hmm. see what they can make out of it as well. And is that is that where you see the future of stellar metamorphosis? Uh, is that that uh, combined input from others? Oh yeah, it's going to take a lot of people to fully develop this theory. I, and I admit that wholeheartedly. Like it's going to take easily around a hundred different people, easily around fifty years to fully like get this whole thing out there. Well, um, I think it might be time for another short video, Jeffrey. Um, and, and, and I'm going to play this uh, as, as like a shout out to everybody who might be watching this, um, that they can involve themselves with this if, if this piques their interest in any way. Um, so um, on behalf of uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to just play this very If anybody wants to work on this, any physical life science will do. Just send me a message on YouTube or to my email, and we'll just warp this theory out.
Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so, all the sciences. <laughs> well, what I would like to do now then, um, do we have any uh, any questions from the uh, the audience? Um, would a anyone? You, uh, fire away, Joan. Uh, Jeffrey, you're forgetting one of your sciences in there. The science that I study, behavioral and developmental sciences of our humans. I sent you a paper about that, remember? <laughs> I remember. Hmm. Yeah. What was uh, what was your take on that, Jeffrey? That that paper. Um, I, I I do no, believe. No, John... no, that here. No, 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 that's okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, the, um, the the panel's open. I'm gonna I'm gonna post the link, and um, if anybody would like to come up and uh, maybe have a chat with Jeffrey um, about anything. Uh, that we've been discussing or or even something that we haven't discussed uh you're more than welcome to to come up um and um and we'd be happy to have you here with us so so uh i mean is is there anything that we didn't cover in that jeff that that you would have liked to have covered um or rather a better way to an, an, ask that is was there a question that i didn't ask you that you would have liked me to ask you what has all this been like for me? Okay, let me ask you that. Jeffrey, <laughs> what has all this been like for you, mate? It's, it's been pretty rough. Short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, yeah, I, I can imagine that. Uh, when you have somebody uh, figure something like this out who isn't connected to those institutions, it's... Uh, it's it. I are you saying then? It, it's been like a minefield in in many ways. Oh yes, oh yes. Like you never know what's going to happen next. Yeah. Well, that's that's true. I mean, none of us really know what might happen uh, at any time, um, or at least uh, how something might unfold. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, we kind of work the work with the best that we got ultimately and uh and and try and find a way through okay uh oh yeah we had someone there but they seem to have gone now uh did you do um we have um uh, was was there any questions in chat john uh let me see um apparently not uh okay uh did you do is is jerry still with us i, I understand he wanted to he he he, uh, he wanted to maybe pop up and ask a few questions. Maybe um, I do believe he he made the um, the the point on one of the the videos that we uh, made for the um, uh, the to bring people into this interview. Um, some oh he's here. I'll let you ask. I'll let him ask you himself. <laughs> uh, welcome up, Jerry. How you doing, mate? Oh, I'm still getting the technical part going here. How okay. are we doing? Um, yeah, I'm doing great, Jerry. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, what do you want to ask, ask Jeffrey? Well, hi, Jeffrey. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, I tried not to throw a bunch of questions in the chat because I figured eventually you'd answer them, and it, it is such a big subject that you weren't going to touch on everything. But I imagine with the way you reason things out, when you started this out and you had to deal with the beginning and end of the universe, you, you knew you were going to hit like this huge brick wall. You had to know that. Oh, and yes, that, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, what, what, what walked you over the edge to, to actually take that battle on? Um, honestly, I looked deep inside myself. I owed it to my 12 year old self. I said to myself, inside of myself, hey, you know, as a 12 year old, will I accept the fact that I'm gonna live my life sharing false information and not really making anything of myself? 
And I asked my 12 year old self that I was like, Hey dude, are you cool with not making anything of yourself? And he said, no, go for it. So I said, okay, let's do this. And it was simple as that. I don't have any, I don't have any uh, motivations for making money on this. I don't have any, um, academic affiliations. I don't plan on really, you know, becoming famous for it or whatever. All I really want to do is owe it or do it for my, for my younger self, that, that, that little boy that is inside of me that says, Hey, this is the right thing to do. Hey, Jerry, do you mind if I just interject um, a question relative to that, what you've just asked? Um, uh, and this ties back to the, uh, the allegory of the cave video that was played uh, prior to the interview. Uh, there was a question in it, and uh, which was, uh, which I'd, I'll, I'll ask you, Jeff, uh, in, in regards to Jerry's question. Is it better to live a just or an unjust life? Ooh, that's a good question. Um... I, I sincerely believe that you should you should live a live a just life. I think you should mm -hmm. do the right thing and sort of push yourself to do the right thing with you know around others and with others and for yourself as well to sort of you know try to lead a good life. I think that's I think that's the, I think that's the approach, the best approach. That's a very uh, it's very uh, um, almost. Uh, well, a very uh, grounded um, approach to take, and um, I think that's that's a great thing to to possess, uh, especially when you're developing something like this. But Jerry, I'm going to throw it back to you, uh, so please continue. Okay. No. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. and well, both All right, so when you were talking about the creation, formation of Earth, I mean, I dealt with science. Uh, the creation versus evolution when I was young and I was really into studying both and trying to figure it all out and uh, my problem with you know the big bang was I couldn't it should be able to reverse engineer it with math and the things should be going mathematically in a certain way by the laws that you're accepted to understand things and it just didn't work that way for me so uh, both of them failed so I'm glad there's a third option here yeah um, but so when I was watching, I see that you, when the star is forming, and, and I have to assume that stars happen not just once; it's an ongoing thing. It, and they and you say they absorb the matter. Now that's a random. Well, surgery. honestly, I don't know exactly how stars form, but I do understand that they evolve in a very slow time scale because the earth is extremely old. You wouldn't have earth four and a half billion years old if whatever process it is didn't take an extremely long period of time. Um, regarding stellar birth, I'm still very um, up in the air about it, but I do know there are some really, really interesting things that are going to happen in the future with regards to, you know, our experimentation with matter and figuring out how things work, figuring out how you know radio what really causes things like radioactivity and you know there's a lot more things to discover and i just sort of i like to leave that kind of like an open-ended type thing um but the idea of white dwarfs and electron degenerate matter being sort of the beginning of a star's evolution i think is more appropriate because the establishment has white dwarfs as the end the ending portion and i'm like no it's, the ending portion is they make large differentiated iron nickel cord objects like the earth so placing white dwarfs at the end it doesn't make sense so that's why i put them at the beginning but and then you know they're made of electron degenerate matter so it, it's sort of it's sort of up in the air with that to be honest with you because i'm i'm trying to walk it through to the diff at the stage when you have different planets like jupiter's different like if you were to say you know earth is going to be mars I, you know, I don't have to wrestle with that. But if you tell me Jupiter is going to be Earth, well, it has to lose a lot of its atmosphere, and it and it has it has a lot more uh, differentiation differentiation to do, and there's a lot more chemistry that needs to occur for it to to get to the Earth stage. Mm, okay, yeah, I I wasn't disagreeing. It's just I got to work harder to get there. You know oh, yeah. what I'm saying? Well, yeah. You got, intermediate, you got intermediate steps too. So it isn't Jupiter to Earth. You got to, you know, look at Neptune too. And then 
now a lot of the data is coming in from the space telescopes about stars and other systems too and they all it's all of the continuum so we have to figure out where they all fit too and it's a it's a pretty big process it's, it honestly it's it's a it's beyond my my skills to be honest with you well yeah well this is uh we're reaching you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. you, you're asking the human mind to do something that it's the edge of it they're, 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 we i've definitely reached the edge and i can't go any further uh, so then a simple one, you, you basically believe our asteroid belt is the collision of two. Well, yeah, yeah, the asteroid belt is just the remains of old dead stars that have, you know, smashed into each other. Okay. Now, so you do believe that the, it's always been the universe. There's no edge to it. And so the creation of a star they all didn't happen at the same time. They keep happening over and over again in well, yeah. the process. There, there's so, another, there's another go ahead. Process, there's another process that creates the galaxies themselves. They call them uh, AGNs or active galactic nuclei. Uh, Victor Ambatsumian, the uh, so the Soviet um, astrophysicist back in I think the 1957 Solvay conference, what he proposed was that the new matter creation happens at the center of galaxies. Now, when the ideas of the, fu the fusion models of stars came out back with the V2FH paper and, you know, the stellar abundances and all that, they didn't, the radio, radio astronomy wasn't really a big thing yet. But in order to see these AGNs, you needed to look at the galaxy, to look at the universe in, in, in the radio frequency. And the radio frequencies are obviously really long band, really long waves. And you can't see these AGNs inside of the visible spectrum or the microwave you have to look at them in the radio spectrum and if you type in a google look look for these things uh look for uh bi bi lobed radio galaxies those are where the majority of the material that stars need to form are, are created now i don't i do not know how those things work but they are incredibly energetic and personally i i find it disappointing that astronomers sort of they, they don't even talk about them because the whole the whole fad is the Big Bang cosmology. But if you want really big bangs, if you want something that really is energetic far beyond our imagination already, they're AGNs, they're active galactic nuclei. That's those are the really energetic things that we need to be studying. Okay. Now I don't want to keep you if you you know because I can ask silly questions all day. Of course, people say what I ask is silly, but. I mean, I do have other things. Not, not at all, Jerry. Um, do you know all questions have some well, were, validation? Were there any questions in the chat? Were there any There's a few there, people that, that there was are one in actually, now. To, uh, there was one about to, null position. I think Church of Four asked about. Oh, I, I, you like, uh, do you want to check your mic? It's, it's uh, uh, mine. Hold on, let me. Let me. <laughs> is mine okay? Ah, uh, yeah. Is that you, Jerry? Or no, I think I think I think that's you, you look. Um, just just check 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 your mic, mate, and then um, uh, and and try and sort that out. Okay, go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. Well, I think there was a question was put about how did he feel about oh. null, null position? Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Um, what what did you think about the null position? Is that right, Jerry? Yeah, that's what was in chat. Mm -hmm. No position. What what do you mean? I, the, I, someone else asked it, and that was that was the almost the entire question. The null position. Uh, in, in, sure. N U L L null. Oh, zero. null position. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. That's um, great. I, I love answers like that. In fact, I appreciate answers like that. So then I'll ask a question while I'm waiting. Do you think that if we can break it down to the smallest thing there is in the universe, that it explains the universe itself? I, I think philosophically, like I remember somebody explaining it like this. It, the universe is as we see it is. There, there is no ultimate reality outside of what we already you know are looking at 
I don't think there's, uh, if you dig deeper and deeper and deeper, there's an ultimate truth. I think the ultimate truth is already right in front of us. Oh, interesting. So I think Brooks and I had discussed something where it was on topic about tectonics, and I, I think that was part of what you delved into. You, or am I on, on the wrong topic there? Yeah, we were talking about uh, platonics being a bogus theory uh, and the process of land formation being a result of the uh, layers building up as the star evolves. If you take something like Jupiter, then, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'll let Jeffrey uh, answer this. Um, uh, oh, just no. to I, I, just to elaborate on the uh, the whole idea of plate tectonics and land formation. Well, I, I remember learning about plate tectonics, and um, the the big the big part about it that stuck out to me was when Earth had a very 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 thick atmosphere, uh, the compression of the entire ball of the earth, even if it had a solid surface, would be a lot greater. So for instance, and I see a lot of uh, um, um, expanding earth people say this, is if you, you know, if you have the earth expanding, then it makes sense as to why all the continents would fit together. Um, but that being said, I think what needs to be explored is the idea that the earth had a huge atmosphere which was compressing down these, the interior of it as it was forming. So all, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the formations, a lot of the, um, the mountains, a lot of the, the things that are different, like the continental shelf versus the ocean basin, all of that needs to be looked at in light of the Earth have had a, uh, have having a, um, a very, very, very thick, highly pressurized atmosphere when those materials are forming. And then when that atmosphere was being lifted up, when the Earth was essentially losing its thick atmosphere, then the internal regions could actually expand out a little bit. But then as we started escaping, then it would contract again as a large plate. So then you would see a lot of the features that the Earth has. So it's, it's not just a simple, oh, well, it, it collapsed or it is, it's expanding. It's a series of of, of many processes that, ha that have happened over hundreds of millions of years. And I think that's a better way of looking at it because we like to try to simplify things, but the truth is that it's a lot more complex. Hey, okay. Jeff, um, Jeff, I, I have a, a question from um, Crystal Sherman. Uh, I think it's a she. Uh, she asks, um, what is uh, your opinion of NASA? Uh, and also, please ask him if he has any information on Tiamat. My opinion of, of NASA? Uh -huh. um, when I was a kid, I used to watch the space shuttle go up a lot. I, uh, I like the idea that they're in the rocket business. I like to watch the rockets go up. Um, you, like you, you are... It. If anybody's looking to see if I'm a moon landing denier, they're, they're going to be disappointed. I believe we landed on the moon back in the 60s. Um, yeah, we went up there. Um, NASA, from my perspective, is a very conformist um, institution. And, you know, for good reason. But also, you know, it was sort of it came around, you know, back in the day when things were very, you know, 1950s conformist. Everybody get along. Everybody do as you're told. Everybody, you know don't stick out, you know, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. And, you know, when you have that kind of institutionalized pressure to not stick out, you sort of, you sort of put it on your own personal group to get along. So, an organization that sort of, you know, keeps it like that. And they have the reasons for doing what they do. But I, I think there's a lot of institutional pressure to, to conform inside of NASA. Uh, to, to keep doing things the way they've always been done, and I, that that's that's basically my my opinion of them. Um, the other question was, uh, uh, do you do you, if 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 you have any information on Tiamat? Uh, what is that? Um, Tiamat is uh, it's the name of a a planet, I guess, 
uh, within a system. Uh, I think um, the closest uh, approximation we can come to it is uh, what NASA described as the TRAPPIST-1 system. Oh, which Trappist is one, the TRAPPIST-1 system? Yeah. So I, I think that's the closest approximation to the TMAT system. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's got lots of different names. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. The, yeah, go the, ahead. The TRAPPIST system, I remember I, I had an idea about that. And I think there's a one in fourth chance that one of those objects in the TRAPPIST system has life on it. Are we talking like life like us or? Ooh, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe dinosaurs. Uh, Hopefully dinosaurs, that'd be cooler. No, uh, the question I've been not asking, yes. <laughs> so in your in the development of the star, the life cycle of the star, when it gets to the point where it's like the planet Earth, is it natural that life develops? Yes. The, the energy of a star's evolution forces life to exist. It's a natural life is a natural result of a star evolving. Given it evolves on a slow enough time scale, if it evolves too fast, and no life's going to form on it. So, given the amount of stars there are, the odds that other places life happens in some form. Oh yeah. Um, Jeffrey, we um, well, uh, we aren't allowed to talk about aliens. That's why I didn't. Well, well, that way. well um, Jeffrey, you, you do have a video on the formation of life, which um, uh, uh, oh, Hewlett, uh, your mic's a, a bit screechy at the moment. Um, could you maybe check that? Uh, yeah, I think maybe going out and then come back in it might be help. But um, anyhow. <laughs> Um, on the uh, on the subject of uh, the formation of life within the theory, I am aware of this. Uh, you did a, a video that was based in part with uh, a guy called Daniel Archer uh, on on um, the way that uh, uh, certain lives spring up with with re reference to how the star evolves. Um, so, w would you like me to play that, Jeffrey? Just for a moment. It's a short video, I do believe. So uh, let me just get to it. Okay. Uh, if I'll, I'll share my video, and, and hopefully, Jerry, this might answer some of your questions. Um, it's a, it's a pretty cool video, is this? Just give. To birth a star, you need to remove the electrons so the matter can get close to itself. Large electromagnetic current inside of molecular clouds. A white dwarf essentially is what's called electron degenerate matter, meaning that nuclei are so close together because their, their electrons are gone, they can be squeezed through a really, really, really small uh, space. It then will start absorbing incoming electrons asteroids and interstellar dust and those incoming electrons are going to cause that electron degenerate matter to spread out again and then the star is going to start expanding considerably a lot of the material inside of a hot young star is completely ionized it's not attached to any molecular bonds or anything as the star cools and dies and it combines the elements into larger and larger molecules these molecules also become heavier. The core is the first object to form as the star evolves, meaning the crust is the last object to form. The star evolves just slow enough to where it can form life. Photosynthesis is one of the very first processes when it comes to the formation of life. Since there are no organelles to produce the glucose, as life has not had enough time to evolve and no plants are available, the reaction occurs sporadically and in huge quantities without organization. As the star evolves, the reactions, which are more complex, occur more often as the heavier synthesized molecules sink into the star. When the star evolves, not only does its physical structure evolve, but life evolves inside the star as it cools and dies as well. 
As the water is synthesized in the top portions of the star, it falls inwards. And over time, these outer layers of the star will start evaporating and the water will just stay put on the surface of that blue dwarf star. The star as it evolves is uh, directly related to the formation of life and life is directly related to the evolution of the, of the astron. The star needs a strong magnetic field to protect it from its host star. Young stars have chaotic magnetic fields like the sun, and as they cool and die, they become global and they shrink significantly as the star dies. Then when the fluid interior stops moving, and the star starts solidifying completely into a giant rock, it doesn't possess the capacity to protect itself anymore so the outer atmosphere gets ripped away and eventually it just becomes a dead world that cannot host life. That was really quite superb. <laughs> So, uh, so Jerry, um, uh, do you, can you take anything away from that short video? Um, does it answer any of the questions that you might have, um, or, or does it even spur you on with even more questions, perhaps? Brooks, you know me. I knew the answer before I asked the question. <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> no, I just want to thank Jeffrey. I appreciate you coming in here. I, I really do like the way you look at things and uh, you don't have any problem answering questions it's it's something you understand but I guess the only thing I see is if when they're a planet they're one way then you should be able to reverse engineer that and understand what the material is that was absorbed in the planet on your theory but that's the only thing I was working on in my head uh, other than that man I really good stuff and I appreciate it yeah, and right. Brooke Brooks, thanks for letting me up and, and you're welcome. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'll ask you, I'll, I'd like to ask you a question, not related so much to the theory, but um, just to just to put up uh, maybe a banner on here. Would you like me to sh um, display your email so people maybe can contact you or um, would you prefer to keep that uh, private uh, for now? Um, private for now. Okay, um, we, we, we have a ticker you see, we can bring a ticker up, but <laughs> if, if, if you don't want me to share that just yet, that's cool. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, uh, there are links to, to Jeffrey's YouTube channel, uh, which has, I, I guess you can contact uh, Jeffrey through there. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, you're welcome, Crystal. Um, welcome, Crystal. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all good so far, and um, yeah, it's, it, this has been a blast. Uh, is is there anybody who would like to come up? Uh, is Ulick still with us? Uh, did he manage to sort his microphone out? Because I think he he might have had a few questions. Um, it, uh, we're kind of winding down at the moment, though. I mean, we've covered so much information. Uh, I think this tops any of your. YouTube talks, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big one. So, Jeff, <laughs> I, I'll give you this opportunity to ask this this group any questions. Like, why would we be a group that would come and find you and drag you into our little <laughs> establishment? Oh, it's um, my my philosophy is sort of you know just take every opportunity as you see it and try to make the most of it. If people want to talk to me about 
what I've been doing. I, I think that's fantastic. And as long as, you know, the atmosphere, you know, is of like, uh, you know, it's cordial, which this atmosphere really is. I don't see any problem with it at all. Well, maybe some of us will get farther into it and have questions and we'll have an opportunity to get you back on. Sounds good. Absolutely. I mean, Jeff, if, you, if you're up for it, we would love to get you back on here and, and we can maybe go into the, uh, the deeper aspects, uh, the more detailed stuff of, of um, what constitutes the theory. And uh, um, this, is a, this is, I think it's may have blown a few minds already, <laughs> but <laughs> here's to many more. <laughs> Um, well, I, I thank you, Jeffrey, and I just, I really appreciate this, that you've been such a wonderful guest, and um, I would like to ask you if you would mind coming back. I hope you enjoyed yourself enough to come back and talk with us more. Oh, for sure. Excellent. Well, on that note, um, I do have just one more video, um, which I, I did want to play on the close of this interview. So. Um, I'd like to say thank you once again, Jeff, for, for coming on to this panel. Hey, up. No. My, right. mic do, my mic does that from time to time. Do you remember what I said about if anything can go wrong, it will? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, um, uh, and excellent. Um, totally. I, 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 you know, I, I have been following this, uh, your theory for a, a good few years now. And, um, I'm 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 thrilled to to be hosting your first public interview and uh, yeah, good on you, man. All right, is so, it, is, is we wrap it up now? Is it over? Are we good? We're we're gonna wrap it up now, but we would like you to come back and and like I said, we we can go into the, the deeper aspects and um, we'll uh, okay. move things up a notch uh, in in due time. So All right. let me know. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll, see you, I'll see you later, Jeff. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye. So to close with this, I'm going to – this last video that I wanted to play um, was a, uh, a, uh, a video on, on the, uh, the troubles that have occurred in, uh, in the science community. Back. Oh, oh, Ulick's back. Um, hang on, Ulick. Um, I'm just about to play one final video and then we're closing. Um, I'll let you up just uh, just for a moment. Uh, are you there, Ulick? Sorry, I'm just going. Just, is my mic working okay now? It's okay now. Uh, but, but, but. Oh, okay, no, I'm, I'm gone. I'm away. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you.